Welcome to Auto Chatter. Today's episode is a sad tale. I mean, it doesn't have any fatalities, so I guess it could be sadder. No, today's chatter is about the Cadillac Cimarron. If you know what one is, then you may already be shaking your head. If you don't, well, prepare yourself for some of the most blatant badge engineering while asking premium money has ever seen. Maybe the more recent Aston Martin Signet was worse, but that was done for different reasons and could be explored for a future chatter. As always, facts, opinions, and speculation will be given. Please give a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Now let's get, I don't know, fake luxury? In the mid-70s, Cadillac launched a smaller car that sold fairly well. The 76 Seville was a response to imports from Mercedes and BMW. Younger buyers were becoming more attracted to these European cars versus grandpa's big caddies. The new Seville was targeting this crowd too and had clean attractive styling. I don't know if anybody knew it at the time, but the Seville was basically a Chevy Nova stretched a bit longer and loaded with luxury features. It also helped that it didn't look at all like a Nova. GM was happy Cadillac could compete in a market that wasn't the usual land yachts they were known for. As the 1980s rang in, Cadillac dealers were getting nervous following another OPEC oil fiasco in 1979 that made gasoline prices skyrocket. Obviously, it was having a negative impact on traditional big caddy sales. Dealers were complaining and demanding a smaller Cadillac, one that could compete with those uh, smaller BMW 3 Series, Volvos, Saabs, and Audis. Some of these dealers were even threatening to drop their Cadillac franchises if their demands were not met. GM was already working on an all-new platform. The other GM divisions would have cars based off of it. That would be the J-Body. This is GM's second and smaller mainstream front-wheel drive platform, as the first was the X-Body that launched in 1980 with the Chevy Citation and its other division's clones. Cadillac actually had plans to offer a car based off the X-Body too, but sales of the Chevy Citations was so large at launch, there was no capacity to make more. They were selling at first around 800,000 of them a year. That's like Ford F-150 numbers today. Now the smaller J-Body development was in the works since the mid-70s, and Chevy and Pontiac already started designing their own compacts. Initially, only these two divisions in the U.S. would use it, and we uh, come to know them later as the Cavalier and Sunbird. Not long after, though, Buick and Oldsmobile started working on their future J-Body cars, too. The decision to greenlight Cadillac getting a J-Body car was only about 10 months before the deadline. In car development terms, that's crazy and pretty unheard of in the business. But those dealers were screaming for something smaller, and not everyone thought this was a good idea. GM's president then had doubts that the general manager of Cadillac could turn a Chevy Cavalier into a convincing Cadillac in under a year. Spoiler alert, he was right. Several names were considered for the new pint-sized caddy, including J2000, which is what the Pontiac version eventually would be called and later changed to Sunbird. They also played around with names that kind of sounded like other Cadillacs with the Cavill. Others considered included the North Star, Envoy, Pegasus, and Carmel. Ultimately, they went with Cimarron, which means wild or untamed in Spanish. The Cimarron met its deadline, and you could buy one for the 82 model year, along with its J-body cousins, the Chevy Cavalier, Pontiac J2000, Buick Skyhawk, and Oldsmobile Forenza. Maybe it was foreshadowing, or Cadillac just wasn't confident in its hurried creation, because it was referred to at launch as Cimarron by Cadillac. It didn't say Cadillac on it anywhere at first, and the salespeople were fussed at if they referred to it as a Cadillac Cimarron. Cimarron was targeting European cars like the BMW 320i and Saab 900, and they thought a Chevy Cavalier would do it. But anyway, the uh, BMW had about 100 horsepower from its four-cylinder, and the Saab had 116. Even more if you went turbo. 
The Cimarron's lone engine offering at launch was a 1.8 liter four-cylinder with 88 horsepower, just like the Cavalier. This would be the Cadillac's first four-cylinder in a car since people were still starting their vehicles with a hand crank in 1914. Zero to 60 was about 13.7 seconds when car and driver tested a Cimarron with a manual transmission. That would be slower than the BMWs or Saabs then by a second or two. This was also Cadillac's first car with a manual since around the time Marty McFly took a trip back in time into the 1950s. The BMW and Saab competitors had a 5-speed manual or automatic optional. The Cadillac came with just a 4-speed one or an optional automatic. At a time when you could buy a Datsun 210 or Toyota Tercel with a 5-speed. Yeah, but those European cars probably cost more, right? Well, the Saab 4-door started under 11 grand then in 1982, which is about 35,000 today. The BMW was about 13,500 to start or 43 grand now. The Cimarron started at 12,100, which is 38,500 or so in 2023. An 82 Chevy Cavalier 4-door was 7,500 bucks without options or just under 24,000 today. That's quite a bit more money for a rebadged economy car. The only exterior differences between a Cimarron and a Cavalier four-door sedan was basically the grille, wheels, and tail lights. Now in an attempt to defend the baby caddy, it had a lot more standard equipment than the Chevy. You got AC, leather seats, power steering, power brakes, thicker carpet, alloy wheels, full gauges, AM FM radio, and other stuff standard. But not everything came with it for no additional charge for that already princely sum. Cadillacs are all about being loaded. So add an automatic transmission, power windows and locks, cruise control, cassette deck, CB radio, yes that was an option, lighted vanity mirrors, rear deck luggage rack, and power trunk opener. It's now about $2,500 more, or eight grand today, for this extra stuff. So leather was standard, but not power locks. Times have changed. At least the Cimarron was good on gas, getting up to 42 miles per gallon highway. What GM did would be like Nissan selling an Infiniti version of a Versa today, but charging almost 40,000 for it and keeping the drivetrain the same. As far as these small caddies European rivals, their reputation seemed pretty safe in this class, and cars like the Honda Accord or six-cylinder Datsun Maxima then was seen as a bargain too in comparison. No need to even get into the superior driving dynamics most of the import competitors like the BMW 3 Series had on the Caddy, but the Cimarron was considered pretty roomy with a soft ride for the class. What's sad was if you really wanted roomy, more power, and even better ride, a 1982 Buick Electra started a few hundred bucks less than the Cimarron then. For 1983, the Cimarron got a larger 2-liter 4-cylinder with throttle body fuel injection, just like the base $6,200 Chevy Cavalier got too, and horsepower was about the same as last year, but it was a better engine overall. By 1985, the Cimarron finally got an engine option more fitting of a luxury brand. A 130 horsepower 2.8 liter V6 was now available and you couldn't get that engine in your Cavalier or Sunbird sedan. But you could on a sporty Chevy Cavalier Coupe or Oldsmobile Forenza two-door hatchback and the Pontiac Sunbird had a turbo optional. Cadillac started offering a 5-speed manual after launch too, which they should have had from the start. As the model years went on, Cadillac had more time to make the Cimarron look less like a Cavalier that got dressed up with accessories from Pep Boys. A new grille and hood in 1985, and they started putting Cadillac badges and crests on it. They also now had lower body trim in gray that reminds me of what we will see on Pontiacs like the Grand Ams later on. For 1986, it got new tail lights, and you could even get options like Bose audio systems or automatic headlights. In 1987, Cimarron got another nose job and was the first J-body to get composite headlights 
versus the regular rectangular ones. If the car looked more like this one at launch with the V6 too, I think its infamous reputation wouldn't be talked about as much today. For 1988, the V6 was made standard. MSRP was now about 16 grand to start, or over 41,000 today. That's still about twice the price of a base four-door Cavalier. GM Brass literally took a vote on keeping it alive, and the results came back 9 to 1 to kill it off, and Cadillac didn't replace it with anything comparable. It's like those commercials where 9 out of 10 dentists recommend some product. What's with that one person who didn't? Anyway, sales for Cimarron were not the best, as you probably guessed by now. First year in 1982 was its all-time high at almost 26,000 sold. It hovered around 20,000 through 1985 and actually broke the 24,000 barrier in 1986. 87 moved about 14,500 of them and less than 7,088 sold, which was the car's last year. Oldsmobile also got out of the J-body business then too, canceling the Forenza and Buick ditched the Skyhawk a year later by the end of the 80s, leaving Pontiac and Chevy as the only divisions to still sell it, which they were the only ones originally that were going to be selling them anyway. Shockingly, the Buick Skyhawk, Pontiac Sunbird, and Oldsmobile Forenza all sold better than Cimarron, plus they all offered different body options like two doors, hatchbacks, wagons, and convertibles. Chevy Cavalier sales absolutely embarrassed the little caddy. About 132,500 Cimarrons were made in total from 1982 to 1988. Chevy sold over 462,000 Cavaliers in 1984 alone. Ouch town population you bro. Guess people could sniff out a bargain and the Cimarron wasn't it. It was rushed due to dealer pressure to make some kind of small car offering and not given much of a budget to make it convincingly distinctive from other J cars. I would have been embarrassed to ask so much for one with a straight face. The first Cimarrons were the worst as they were basically just better appointed Chevy Cavaliers with a steep price tag. The car did not fool many and the automotive press has not been kind to it over the years. Some say it seriously hurt Cadillac as a brand. A brand that was already losing market share as their traditional buyers were literally starting to die off. In 1982, Cadillac had close to 6% of the U.S. market share. By 1988, it was about 2%. Today, it's about half that. The rise of imports in the 1980s hurt the division, and trying to compete with rebadged Cavaliers or offering problematic 864 cylinder deactivation engines wasn't the answer. Hard to believe that J-Body cars were the GM competitors to the Honda Accord and Toyota Camry at one point. This wouldn't be Cadillac's only goofs, as they tried to pass off an Opel Omega as a caddy later on, but that's another story. Anyway, this has been my Cadillac Cimarron chatter, and I do hope you enjoyed it. Please give a like and subscribe to let me know. I'd also like to give my apologies in advance if you're a huge Cimarron fan. And until next time, chatter out.